Why James Cameron's Avatar is Not Anti-Military, Part 2. In Part 1 of this lecture, we have already introduced Avatar a little and discussed a little on why I'm giving this lecture. In addition to that, we also have given a structured outline of what is to be discussed. We will first turn our attention to what is one of the contributing factors that gave what weekly standard film critic John Podhortz coined its avatarociousness. The term happens to be the title of his article about the film in Weekly Standard. And here it is, point one, which deals with military disparagement criticisms. I'm going to point out first that uh, much of these concerns are ground in the notion that perception is reality, meaning that people interpret what they see. And the agent behind claims of negative portrayal of the armed forces lies in our first factor of discussion, the actions of the military. And this is where we'll dig deeper into the meaning of what is meant by military disparagement. And just as a heads up, throughout the rest of this lecture, I'm going to use the term anti-military in the context of anti-American armed forces, or for want of a better term, in the context of the film being a disparagement or an affront to America's armed forces. Now, for those of you who may have difficulty figuring out what I mean by military disparagement here, the concept deals with the issue of America's armed forces being portrayed in a way that seems offensive to patriotic Americans who believe, and I do too, that our armed forces have a glowing reputation. In the context of this film, I mean that our American soldiers and servicemen do the opposite of what you perceive the military and avatar is doing in the film. Our armed forces focus on bringing peace to a conquered land, or an occupied land. They try their best not to cause civilian casualties, and more importantly, they do not use excessive force against their enemies. So as you can see on the picture on your left, you see the military force in play, SecOps, assaulting Home Tree, the ancestral home of the Omatakaya, the indigenous tribe of the Na'vi, who happened to be the humanoid inhabitants of Plant Pandora. But for some of you listeners who may not be familiar with this place, uh, Home Tree is a large majestic tree, uh, laughingly dubbed by John Podhortz in his weekly standard article about Avatar as a Keebler elf tree because, well, it looks like a Keebler elf tree. And it is inhabited by the Omatakaya. And it is this tree that gets destroyed, well, felled, for want of a better term, by the flying gunships of the SecOps military piloted by the nasty humans. Now, such an action understandably smacks of grave injustice to one's fellow men. And understandably so, because it is a gross infringement on your private property rights. I mean, think about it. How would you like it if your home was destroyed intentionally, especially if it was the home of your ancestors? You see, this scene is so heart-wrenching that John Podhortz wrote in his Avatar article that, and I quote, you could hear James Cameron weeping over his special effects computer, unquote, over the injustice of the humans uprooting the livelihood of the eight-foot-tall Smurfs. And the fact that James Cameron was, in my opinion, able to evoke such emotion from his audience over this scene, successfully, I might add, testifies to the mastery of his movie-making craft. Which, in keeping with the topic of military disparagement, leads to another problem. Given the heart-wrenching nature of this scene, it is quite possible that such an action has prompted complaints of the film being anti-military. To my right are two opinions that state, in essence, the same theme of Avatar being suspected as such, each of which I will explain in brief and will delve into their contexts. And throughout the rest of this lecture, these two people whom these quotes are attributed to will be the spokespeople representing the people, particularly Americans in general, who assert that Avatar is an anti-military film. The first quote is by Colonel Brian Salas the United States Marine Corps Director of Public Relations. He stated in a recent letter to the Marine Corps Times that, and I quote, the film takes sophomoric shots at our military culture 
and uses the lore of the Marine Corps and over-the-top stereotyping of Marine warriors to set the context for the screenplay. This does a disservice to our Corps of Marines and the public's understanding of their Corps." Unquote. So in other words, James Cameron's Avatar takes a juvenile look at America's armed forces. Juvenile in the sense that, in spite of significant technological advances made in the human race, the humanitarian aspect present in today's armed forces has not caught up with the military in Avatar. And, as a result, from Colonel Salas's point of view, our Marine Corps personnel are stereotyped and misrepresented. The second quote is from Mark Whittington, the associated content contributor who wrote an article titled Avatar, A Tribute to the Marine Corps. Please note in this article title, the word tribute is in quotation marks, implying that Avatar is far from a tribute to the Marine Corps at all, and instead irreverently misrepresenting the Corps. A significant passage in Mr. Wellington's article states that, and I quote, the reality of American Marines is far from the calumny that showed up in Avatar, unquote. In other words, America's armed forces have been slandered, that is, misrepresented in the film as regards to its conduct towards foreign peoples in territories American soldiers and servicemen were occupying. Now, these quotes are in defense of the notion that our armed forces would not do the very thing that the military and Avatar did against Home Tree. Or would they? Well, you could argue that American troops drove out the Native Americans out of their lands, burned them out, and even killed significant numbers of them. But that was a very long time ago. Today, America's armed forces are, I should say, far more humanitarian toward foreign peoples across the world. I hope they are. In fact, it can be said that today's high-ranking officers in charge of our armed forces branches place more emphasis on diplomacy and maybe less on military conquest. That's not to say, of course, that military conquest is out of the equation when planning strategy in the war room, but diplomacy toward other countries has become an integral part of military strategy across the globe, as it would have the benefit of minimizing casualties both on the side of our armed forces and on the side of the foreigners, not to mention the reducing hostility between the two sides. I guess that's the case today because today's advanced weaponry, which include nukes now in its arsenal, is so accurate, so deadly, and may have the potential to cause untold apocalyptic damage that in order to stave off the sheer destructiveness of another world war, possibly World War III, you would have to seek peace with your neighboring countries across the globe. But all in all, I think it's very important for me to point out that I don't think James Cameron is saying that we should feel guilty about what Americans did to the Indians. Or rather, he wants us to be aware of things like that. Cameron wanted to create a dissonant atmosphere of awareness toward the issue of driving indigenous peoples out of their homelands, and to make us reflect about it.